So welcome back, everyone. James Chegwidden, who's, uh, who's joined us, is a UK barrister, originally from Australia, called to the bar by Lincoln's Inn in 2008, and now practising from Old Square Chambers in London. James specialises in equality and discrimination law and public law cases, and formerly worked at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and was appointed Attorney General's Counsel to the, to the Crown in 2013. And... Um, James has been heavily involved in cases relating to non-therapeutic male circumcision. And uh, I will now hand over to James to speak about One Green Bottle, Male Circumcision and the Law. Right, well, thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, for those very kind words. Um, I just try... Oh, we have got my slides up front of you. Well, I've named my speech uh, today after a children's rhyme, which most people have uh, heard, and I hope it's one that has some allegorical relevance to my topic. Um, now, the first thing I'm going to have to work out is how to use this slide uh, machine, and I think I go... There we go. Yes. Right, success. I hope I'll be able to manage that. Well, we all know what One Green Bottle is about, the, sto the song, and I think it is relevant to this topic because for many uh, s scholars, the 20th century really was the century in which the law as it relates to children's rights um, dramatically improved from a legal perspective in which children had virtually no rights at all. They were essentially the possession of their parents uh, to do what they liked with, so long as they didn't murder them, um, into a world in which their rights were first acknowledged and then, in the latter part of the 20th century, even defended. And it's no accident that it was as late as 1983 uh, that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child was passed into international law, which was the first time uh, that children uh, became holders of international legal rights outside of a war zone. Um, very late, but nonetheless uh, timely. And if we see the area of children's law as a wall and the obstacles to fair treatment of children as the green bottles, we really have been living in a world in which over the last hundred years, one green bottle after another has accidentally or not so accidentally uh, been pushed by lawyers like me, uh, have been pushed off the wall. So uh, we have a situation in which, for example, things like child labour abolished, more or less, um, severe corporal punishment, corporal punishment in schools, um, what else, barriers to access to education, uh, and of course uh, FGM. Uh, have become legally uh, impossible. Um, so they exist, they haven't been completely uh, wiped off the face of the earth, but they have become, in terms of legal um, analysis, something that's unacceptable in our society. But there is one bottle left, and I'm afraid that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today, because there is one green bottle that hangs on the wall. It is an absolute anomaly, in my opinion, but it does hark back to the period 100 years ago when children had no rights, and it just hasn't been sufficiently looked at by our society, or uh, those who have have chosen not to uh, take any action. Um, that, of course, is the phenomenon of the forcible circumcision of minors, in this case male minors, uh, which we are still, um, as a society, either in favour of or prepared to turn a blind eye to. So I've got a very short time to speak to you, but what I want to do in this short presentation, which really cannot cover very much, it's going to be a whistle-stop tour, I'm going to be honest with you, um, what I want to deal with is just three big headings uh, in this growing area. Uh, the first is to deal with why I say, as a barrister, that 
the genital cutting, which is often, I'm going to have to use the phrase uh, that's more, more commonly used, simply circumcision, of male minors is a deep anomaly in our legal system. It doesn't fit within the legal system we have today. Um, and it contradicts really every other principle of law from whatever angle you wish to approach it from. That's my position. Not everyone would agree with that, but uh, that's what I'm going to defend today, that the genital cutting of male minors is an anomaly in our legal system. I want to say where the law has got to on this, because the law has made some improvements in this area over the last century, not nearly enough, but it has made some improvements. I want to tell you what those are, and I want to tell you why I think we need to do more. And then lastly, I want to just finish with discussing really what we can do about it, because I'm here talking mostly not to lawyers, uh, but to uh, healthcare professionals, and of course, I think it's actually in that area that more progress possibly can be made than on our side as lawyers. So, all right, well, first of all, I want to talk with talk to you about what this talk is not about, because it's important to get a few things out of the way first. First of all, um, I hope it's obvious, that this topic is not about being for or against the tradition of uh, male circumcision per se. Um, that practice clearly has a very venerable tradition. It's gone on for thousands of years in many cultures. Uh, many people feel very attached to it, and some people derive a great meaning from their own circumcision status. Uh, that is not of concern to me. I'm quite happy for people to like circumcision uh, as a practice or not to like it. Um, but what is, what is of concern uh, is that this is a practice which largely is not imposed upon adults who want it, but on children who do not consent and cannot consent uh, to the practice. That is the concern. So it's not a, an objection to circumcision per se, just as much as one can be for or against tattooing. Um, as an, For adults to um, uh, like tattoos is fine. What they can't do in our law is to tattoo a child just because they happen to like tattooing themselves. And it's the same in my, it should be the same in my opinion with circumcision, but I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Second of all, while I appreciate that I'm talking at a secular medical conference, and I'm honoured to be doing so, this topic isn't really, strictly speaking, about secularism either. Um, by that I mean that your approach to this topic does not or shouldn't depend on whether you have a secular outlook in life or whether you have a faith-based approach to life. Um, and I think one problem in this debate, and I'm afraid I think it's a problem that set us back to a degree in this area, is the perception in certain quarters that really what's going on in this debate is an underlying debate underneath it. Namely that if you're a religious person, you're supposed to be for circumcision of children. If you're a secularist or a humanist or an atheist, you're supposed to be against circumcision of minors. Now, that's sadly how a number of people do see this debate. And the reality is I've been in these debates for years and years and years, and I can tell you that it's a complete myth because I know many devoutly committed religious people who are against the forcible genital cutting of children, including in communities where it's very common. And in my own chambers, I know some very ardent secular atheists who think I'm appalling for uh, trying to oppose the practice and want it to continue. So this is not a debate about people of faith as opposed to people of a humanist outlook. And I'd be equally happy to give this talk at, at say, a, uh, a religiously based healthcare conference. Um, thirdly, and perhaps surprisingly, and this is where I, I hope to develop a little bit, um, I'm more and more convinced the more I talk about this subject that actually, uh, as far as the law goes, this whole issue is much less a problem about how the law deals with religion, it's much more a problem with how the law deals with children. And I know Brian is actually going to talk about this issue later and probably much better than me, but I'm going to just uh, mention that because it comes back later. And the reason why I say that this is more an issue about how the law deals with children 
rather than how the law deals with, with religion is when we compare it to how the law treats a full rights holder in this area, namely an adult. So, right, that's what this talk's not about. What is this act talk going to be about? Well, in extreme brevity, the position, uh, I think I should tell you a little bit about what, where we are with uh, genital cutting in this country, because it's mainly, this is mainly a conference about the UK. Um, in this country, tens of thousands of children uh, every year, uh, that's male, male infants, are genitally cut. We don't have accurate statistics because one of the problems of this area is that no statistics outside hospitals and some GP surgeries need to be done at all. Uh, but it is estimated, even by the NHS and generally anecdotally, that about 15% of males in this country have undergone circumcision, and uh, that is, of course, the removal of the entirety of their foreskin, which is a normal component of their body. Uh, the vast majority of those, 15%, uh, have had uh, circumcision imposed on them as children and without, obviously, their, their, their choice uh, and without a therapeutic need. In the UK, there is no legal requirement for circumcision by a doctor. You do not have to be a doctor to circumcise a, a child. You have to simply uh, have, if you are going to undertake the, the procedure, you need to uh, do it competently. Uh, but that's all. No requirements for registration or uh, any form of training or skill whatsoever. But if you undertake the job, you have to do it competently. And we know, sadly, that many of the people in this country doing it are not competent. And if you'd like to see... The reason we know that is because some of the worst cases have appeared in front of the Crown Court for uh, severe child cruelty and, uh, and manslaughter because some children circumcised in the last five years have died um, because of the problems arising from a very poor, poor case. So we know that that's the situation, but uh, in practice, a circumciser requires no training whatsoever. Uh, there is no requirement of authorization. A parent doesn't have to justify their reasons for wanting circumcision of their child. The only effective threshold requirement is that both parents in law must agree for it to proceed. So uh, a child who, for whom one parent agrees and one parent doesn't is in a much, much, much better position, uh, even though their, their rights are pretty much identical. So we don't have the, we don't have the time really today to d discuss the issue of the harm done by this procedure, but a safe way to proceed really is to categorise it in the way that the criminal law would. And so that's what I'm going to do today. Um, because from the point of view of the criminal law, any invasion of the body which uh, it cuts the dermis of the skin, which occasions pain, bleeding, scarring, and the amputation of any part of the body, which circumcision always does, uh, will amount to wounding in the criminal law, which is a more serious form of harm than uh, actual bodily harm. It's actually if the wounding is actually part of the same statute section of the statute as grievous bodily harm, and that's interesting because, of course, uh, the CPS's charging uh, policies identify FGM as always amounting to grievous bodily harm, no matter how uh, significant or insignificant the cutting event. Um, and we also have a definitive decision by the High Court, and this is by the President of the Family Division in a case called B&G, which I'll come to later, in which Lord Justice Munby determined that from the point of view of the Children's Act, 1989, any case of uh, male genital cutting will amount to significant harm within the meaning of the Children's Act. Now, that's just the legal point of view. I know some people will disagree, but that is the way the law looks at male genital cutting. So, well, what's wrong with that? Well, perhaps one would start by saying, well, any deliberate infliction by one person of significant harm, physical harm on another person who doesn't consent, is at least problematic. But, of course, whenever I start that argument, you always get people on the other side saying, well, not very harmful, really. Actually, my children have had it, and I've had it, and I'm fine, and it doesn't, I don't think there's any real harm. So that ends up going down a bit of a rabbit warren. I think, uh, although I, I should say, I think there is a significant case for major harm being done here. Um, but let's look at it in a clearer way, because there is a clearer way to look at that, look at this. And, and the way that you should be able to see, I think, that this position is problematic 
is to compare that situation of the imposition of circumcision on a child with the situation <laughs> in which the law is dealing with a full rights holder, namely an adult. Okay. Because everyone agrees that an 18-year-old is a full citizen, a full bearer of all the human rights that we say we believe in as a society. And the reason why this is a good way of looking at it is because pretty much everyone in this debate, the most pro-circumcision advocate and the most opposed, will agree on what the situation is when we're dealing with an adult. So it's a nice platform to start from, and I want to start from this. If you were to do exactly the same thing to an adult that we do in the community every day to a circumcised child, namely to take his body, pin him down, cut off his foreskin, usually without much anaesthetic, make him bleed, leave him scarred, without seeking any consent whatsoever, then irrespective of your intention and belief in undertaking that operation, irrespective of how much you think this procedure is justified or a good thing, everyone agrees that that would be a very serious offence and that you would end up being convicted and imprisoned for that very serious offence. Now, it's interesting that everybody agrees with that because the only thing that changes when you look at the genital cutting imposed on a child is the age of the victim. That's it. Nothing else changes. The religious intention stays the same, the procedure stays the same, the irreversibility stays the same, everything's the same. The only thing that changes is the age of the child. And this is why I say, when we're talking about genital cutting, we are actually not unclear about, personal, about how personal autonomy and religious freedom interacts. We're actually very clear on that when we're talking about an adult no one will disagree with you. We're very clear about how far bodily autonomy goes and how far religious freedom goes when the adult is concerned. Where we wobble is as soon as we've got a child involved. And that's why I say this is not a case primarily about the law interacting with religion. It's about the law interacting with children. And we really have to remember that. Now, I'd like to... My position here is that there isn't a single field of law that touches this topic that doesn't have its principles fundamentally violated by the phenomenon of infant circumcision. And I've spent 10 years, which is practically my whole life as a barrister, listening to arguments for circumcision of children. And I can say that whether it be criminal law, whether it be equality law, whether it be anti-discrimination law, whether it be civil law, whether it be family law, whether it be medical law, children's law, human rights, human rights law, and actually also the law, the law of religion of belief and conscience, not one of them will support the practice of infant circumcision. It is an anomaly, a complete standout anomaly. Now, I'd like to be, I'd be delighted to be able to talk about each and every one of those fields, but first of all, you've got better speakers to hear after me, so I, we don't have time for that. I, I can do it, and I've, I've thought about it a lot, so I'm, I'd be delighted to, but you'd be here all day. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to content myself with just one or two by way of example and hope that you will you know, uh, believe me that uh, the, the, the same theme flows through. So... Uh, I think, we're, we're running out of time already, but I think, well, well, we've quickly, I mean, I've actually already covered what uh, criminal law would say. Uh, I've already told you that, that it will always satisfy the legal definition of actually bodily harm and wounding, and that amounts to significant harm. That's the sections of the Act, Defences Against the Person Act, not particularly exciting, but there we are. Um, that's, what, that's what the law is to say, that any form of assault at this level will be uh, a, a, a serious one. What, uh, there's a bit of a definition there, which I'm going to go over very quickly, but um, I've already told you that circumcision in any standard form will, will, will meet the test. <coughs> What's interesting is that there are some exceptions to um, the infliction of actual bodily harm, but very importantly, consent actually will not validate in English law an assault at the level of actual bodily harm. Even if you consent, you cannot... That is not a defence to 
an assault as serious as actual bodily harm. We do ex exempt within the criminal law a few activities which in the common law have been determined not to be falling within this uh, category. But w you can see very quickly the three I've put up there, sports, so including boxing and so on, tattooing and ear piercing and body piercing. Um, but of course all of those activities have a very strong element of consent by the person doing the action. The person who plays sports wants to play sport and uh, so therefore it's an inherent part of the good thing that they want, uh, that they are in fact um, taking a risk that there will be some injury and so on. <laughs> tattooing of course as well. I might point out that the Tattooing and Mining Act only includes adults, it excludes children. Um, Body piercing as well, what no one thinks. That is, of course, technically um, a, 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 an intervention on the skin, but of course, if it's consented to, that's an exception. There is no established exception for ritual circumcision. There is one uh, comment in a case in 1994 in which Lord Templeman, without any argument on the point, said, oh, and also ritual circumcision will be in that category. But everybody agrees that... Uh, his comment there was obito. In other words, it doesn't apply to the case, and he never heard any arguments about the uh, about the phenomenon of circumcision. And in fact, uh, the irony of that case is that he was sending to prison someone who had actually driven a nail through another person's foreskin by their consent, another adult. So it's ironic that at the same time he was <laughs> at the same time he's saying this is terrible that someone has done this damage to this adult man by his consent. Um, but I will say that doing it to a child without their consent is absolutely fine. So that's a very, very, it's a very silly comment by Lord Templeman. No one can take that one seriously. So there really isn't an established category. Um, right, we've got five minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to have to uh, get, go. I'm going to have to uh, leave a few, a few categories out. What I will say is, it's often thought, well, maybe there must be some sort of cultural or, or uh, religious or philosophical freedom of belief defence. But the answer is there isn't. And it's very interesting. Most of the people that, that pr promote the idea of a defence are actually... Um, they struggle to show a single example. But I can show you some examples of where it doesn't matter what form of religion or philosophy you deal with, anyone who inflicts harm on a child at this level will be convicted irrespective of their intention. So here are three examples in the criminal law. The first one is a case called Adesanya, which is a case where someone from an a African traditional uh, community came to this country uh, she ritually scarred her children's, or cut her children's faces in, in all sorts of ways, um, which, is a, which was an entry criterion into adulthood for her particular tribe. Um, if she'd have done it in Africa, she probably would have got away with it, but in this country she was caught. And uh, she, of course, at the Old Bailey said, this is what my religion culture says every child should have done to them. I was only following my culture, uh, and so that's my defence. Uh, she lost. Uh, that was, it was quite routinely uh, established that uh, a cultural defence doesn't exist to this level of harm. So that's one form. That's from 1974. Case of, que of Senior is a case where a person who had uh, it was a rather strange Christian sect called the Peculiar People. <laughs> that was their actual name. I know it sounds right like bizarre. It was a Victorian sect. But anyway, um, they believed that no medicine was acceptable within God's law and so if a child was suffering you in fact just had to let them uh, suffer and a child almost died uh, the father was brought before the court uh, he said well I, I did this out of uh, a, a religious belief that I, in good faith um, the, the court and that's still that's actually very interesting because it's a Victorian case so um, quite old but the court said no not a defence um, uh, last of all we've got Queen against Zed this is a case about a man taking his two teenage sons to a mosque where a flagellation um, ritual was going to be carried out. There was evidence that the child actually was quite happy to carry this out upon himself. The child was 13. Um, and uh, the man uh, was ultimately um, arrested because a doctor found all these marks of scars on the child's back. Uh, and, of course, the man, same argument. I've got a religious defence. Uh, this is my belief, it was in good faith and so on, he was convicted as well. So there isn't actually a defence 
for cultural religious belief and, and so on. Right, I have almost no time left, so what, I, what, I, what I'm going to rush to, uh, I'm going to pass over the civil law, I'm going to pass over the other fields of law, I'm going to pass over the BMA, but I'm going to come to the one, one issue that people do talk about a lot, because most of the people who are in favour of continuing genital cutting will say, well, the European Convention... Uh, on human rights, Article 9 says that everyone has a right to freedom of, uh, of belief and, uh, and conscience, and that's my, that's my right to, to conduct, conduct circumcision. But most of the people that talk about it don't actually have a nuanced understanding of what Article 9 allows. There's Article 9 there, and it's true that in Article 9.1, Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This includes freedom to change religion and belief, either alone or with others, public or private, to manifest his religion, belief in worship, teaching, practice, and observance. Okay. That's the right. But we can see straight away that it's a qualified right, because subsection 2 says that your freedom to manifest your beliefs will be subject only to such limitations as are prescribed by law and are necessary in the interests of public safety for the protection of public order, health or morals, or the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. So these are all qualifications on the right. So where this right clashes with some of the interests below, you can rest- religious, religious freedom is restricted. We don't have an absolute right of freedom of religion. And what Article 9 appears to be getting at is to protect the right of the individual to have a belief and to practice that belief for themselves. That is really what the right is is saying, that there is an inviolable space where the state can't intrude on the conscience of a person. But what Article 9 is not doing is saying that you have a right to impose your belief and practice on someone else. Uh, we've all, we all, if you grew up as I did in the 80s and 90s, we all sat through... You know, the wars in the Balkans and so on, and the various sort of forced conversions and so on. And of course, we see in Islamic State, the this is within the Muslim community, but the sort of convert or die mentality. That is not a, a right that Article 9 protects, the right of someone from ISIS to say, you either convert to my way of Islam or you die. That's not Article 9. Article 9 is there, was there to stop people imposing their beliefs and practices on another person. So Circumcision within the context of Article 9 doesn't actually look very good because it is actually the imposition on someone else irreversibly of a, uh, of a, a form of belief and practice that, um, that, that results in an invasion of something down here, namely the protection of the rights and freedoms of others and actually the health of others in some cases. So Article 9 really isn't a great, uh, a great bulwark of defence for pro-circumcision theory. Uh, I'm running out of time, but what I th- I want to uh, I'm sorry, I am out of time. Oh, okay, right. Well, okay. Well, what I was going to say, well, what I was <laughs> <laughs> terrible, isn't it? Barristers are terrible at predicting the amount of time they're going to take to give their talk. But what I was what I what I won't say, but I'll leave it to questions if you want to, is how far the law has come to try to recognise this, and it has come a little way. Um, so there are four cases in the last year where the court has said the best interests of a child are not to be uh, circumcised and for, their, for the decision to be deferred until they are old enough uh, to make their own decision. So we do have a, a, a repeated decisions from the court to say the best interests of the child do not involve being circumcised until they're an adult. But there's a lot further to go uh, and I think ultimately it's probably going to be in the healthcare field that that uh, that that progress is made because the law is only an instrument and unless there's people who are actually prepared to reinforce the message uh, that uh, this is a practice which really doesn't m- match anymore the way we think about the dignity of a person and the dignity of a child uh, then uh, the law isn't going to be enforced. So we need people, particularly healthcare professionals and other people people in faith communities and so on, to be saying, well, this really is one of the elements of the way we did treat children uh, that we now realise doesn't match anymore 
any of our other fundamental principles. So I'm going to leave you there. I'm sorry that I can't talk any longer, but Anthony will not um, will needs to keep needs to keep on time. Uh, so I think there's a couple of questions, and otherwise I think I'm speaking. I'm going to be uh, open to questions later too. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry to cut James off um, mid-flow, though. I could listen to him all day. Um, 